Good afternoon. My name is Jean Tillman and I'm the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Director of the Erickson Institute here at the Austin Riggs Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Welcome to the final of four roundtables examining the experience of immigrants and refugees and how this diverse group shaped 20th century North American psychoanalysis. The roundtable series honors the late Anton O. Chris, an immigrant from Vienna and a supporter of the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. The roundtable discussions are part of a larger project that the Erickson Institute is embarking on in collaboration with the Freud Mu Museum Vienna entitled From Despair to Hope, The Holocaust, Immigration, and Psychoanalysis in North America. In a few weeks here in Stockbridge, we will open an exhibition that has been at the Freud Museum Vienna that tells the story of the organized escape of psychoanalysts from Vienna in the 1930s. If you're in Stockbridge this summer, we invite you to visit the exhibit. <clears throat> As part of the exhibit, we're gathering stories of immigration and we encourage anyone here today to submit your story and we'll tell you how to do that in the link in the chat to join the exhibition, have your story be part of the story we're trying to tell. As we begin, let me note that the Austin Riggs Center is in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, a town started as a mission to the Mohicans who are the indigenous peoples of this land. With sometimes painful self-reflection and humility, we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on their ancestral homelands. After enduring tremendous hardship and being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor and pay respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Thank you. Now, on to some housekeeping details. As you can see, we have the chat function on during the lecture, so please use it to comment to let us know where you're joining from. You're eligible to receive 1.5 CEs or CMEs for today's presentation. And the chat section has information on how to complete the evaluation and receive credit and the certificate. But please be aware it can take up to 24 hours for your attendance to register in our system and you must have attended the entirety of this webinar to receive credit. Now I want to welcome Dr. Daniela Fenzi, our collaborator from the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. Daniela. Yes, um, thank you, Jane, and hello. Good evening, um, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you today from the Sigmund Freud Museum here in Vienna. And I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to all the panelists and to all the Zoom participants. Let me just tell you that I'm really excited and happy about this enriching collaboration between the Ericsson Institute of the Austerich Center and the Sigmund Freud Museum. Starting from, an, starting from historical events, we have now arrived for this fourth and final panel in the present, a present which is marked by migration caused by wars and climate crisis. Since psychoanalysis as a form of thought and ther therapy must always respond to the suffering of its time, it's more than indispensable to interrogate our time and today with this evening and also to draw on psychoanalysts' own experience of exile. I'm glad that Spiris the Orphanos has accepted this invitation to moderate this panel. I'm very much looking forward to the contributions now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. I now uh, have the privilege of introducing our moderator for today's roundtable. Dr. Spiros Orphanos is a director of the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. He's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, and he's the past president of the Society of Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology, or Division 39 of the APA, and the International Association of Relational Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy from 2012 to 2013. Dr. Orfnos is on the advisory board of the Sigmund Freud Museum of Vienna. And on April 27th, in just a few, in just a week, I guess, he will be recognized for his human rights work by the Society of Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology of the APA, 
with the International Activism for Social Justice Award. It's now my great pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Orphanos. Thank you, uh, Jane. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are on this planet. It's a pleasure to uh, be here on this panel uh, and um, to uh, follow three amazing panels. Uh, and this one will be a little bit different, although it will be historical and it will be from the heart and it will be um, uh, following up to paraphrase uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Thomas Cohut, uh, it will probably say a great deal about how culture and society and history saturates individual subjectivity. So um, I think uh, uh, my prediction is that you, you will find this a very engaging and a very uh, uh, important panel to help us understand some of the issues around not just forced immigration, but even issues around uh, forced emigration, but around all kinds of immigration issues and even migration issues, which is uh, such an incredibly important topic uh, these days. Um, and it probably has been throughout history. It's just that we're, it's happening more now, I think, for various reasons. And at least in our lifetime, uh, it's been uh, epic, I think. Emigration and immigration and uh, migration has uh, played a huge, huge role and certainly having to do with all kinds of political reasons, geopolitical reasons, and now recently even climate change reasons, which is something for us to to be mindful of. I'm very thankful to Dr. Jane Tillam and Dr. Danielle Finzi and Dr. Tom Cohut for organizing this and uh, for uh, um, creating the kind of scholarly and also personal atmosphere that they have and that we will try to continue uh, today. So I will begin uh, the way that the panel is organized, people will speak for about eight to 10 minutes. We have four panelists and it will be in the order that they are listed. And I will introduce all the panelists right now and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll begin the, the talk. And after each one has spoken, we'll probably have a short conversation amongst ourselves. And then uh, we'll, as uh, Dr. Tillam said, we'll go to some of the Q&A uh, from uh, the uh, planet, from the rest of the planet. So let me begin with Dr. Maurice Sapri, who is a, a retired professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Uh, he trained in child and adolescent psychoanalysis at the Hampstead Clinic, now the Anna Freud Center in London, and in adult uh, psychoanalysis at the New York Freudian Society, now the contemporary Freudian uh, society. And he's been in this field for over uh, four decades, uh, long enough for institutions to change their names uh, and become more, uh, more contemporary. Um, he's done an awful lot of work, international work, has taught, has uh, been a clinician. And just to keep it a, a short uh, for in terms of our, our introductions, he has uh, upcoming will be uh, an edited volume of his uh, collected essays, Transgenerational Haunting in Psychoanalysis, colon, Toxic Errands. And that will be out by Rutledge, so be on the lookout for that. The next presenter is Dr. Marina Bayeva, uh, who is the Director of Neuropsychopharmacology and Medical Services and a Fellow in Hospital-Based Psychotherapy and Psycholytic Studies at the Austin Riggs Center. And she will be followed by Yulia Beltziu, who is a graduate of the NYU postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. And she has presented nationally and internationally on the topic of immigration and identity. And in 2016, she edited a very important anthology titled Immigration in Psychoanalysis. And that came out of uh, Rutledge and she maintains a private practice in New York, where she works with adults, couples, and adolescents. And last, Usha Kamala Nara, 
is a clinical psychologist and director of community-based education at the Albert Jesse Danielson Institute. And she's a research professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University, at Boston University. And she too has a long uh, and uh, important uh, history in conducting research and scholarship on immigration, trauma, race, and culturally informed psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And um, she uh, uh, practices and works primarily with survivors of trauma from diverse socio-cultural backgrounds. And she has a number of um, books out that have uh, been published by the American Psychological Associations. And uh, the first is called Psychoanalytic Theory and Cultural Competence in Psychotherapy. And then an, an edited volume titled Trauma and Racial Minority Immigrants, Turmoil, Uncertainty and Resistance which came out a couple of years ago. So that doesn't do justice to their uh, uh, biographical information, but maybe they'll give us an opportunity to hear a little bit about some of their personal experiences around immigration and perhaps even how that may have led to her, their becoming psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, and psychoanalysts. Uh, so let's begin with Dr. Apri. And uh, you each have about eight to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was born in Ghana, West Africa, some 75 years ago. I trained in child, adolescent and adult analysis at the New York Freudian and the Hampstead Clinic. And I'm now completing 42 years as a full professor at the University of Virginia, a place founded by Thomas Jefferson, a champion of religious freedom, and paradoxically, a man who owned slaves. So there's a story there, how a man comes all the way from South from Ghana, West Africa, to try to overturn the toxic impact of Jim Crow laws. So there's a short answer to how I come to this, which is that I bring with me a pre-ambivalent view that human beings are basically good, but I juxtapose it with a powerful lens of psychoanalysis to address human tragedy. Four strands feed my coming to psychoanalysis. The first is about the, the word metaphor and its contrast metonymy. I grew up in this big house owned by my grandfather. And from the side of the house where his office was, I could see every morning for what Amsterdam, the ruins of the castle, of Amsterdam built by the Dutch during the slave trade. In West African history, we were told that battering was the way the early Europeans and the indigenous people exchanged goods, quote, of equal value. But enter metonymy. Someone comes and says, ah, now we can sell humans. Exchanging goods of unequal value. So this is one piece of my thinking about the inchoate part of my thinking about psychoanalysis. As Dean of African American Affairs, at the University of Virginia, so much of my work has been the heavy lifting of taking people from disadvantaged places, people who have suffered the toxic impact of Jim Crow laws and the violence of poverty into a new place, such as Ivy's, to study medicine law and competitive workplaces like Wall Street. Two, 
animism and fetishism. From the front of the house, I could see a big tree, a tree that was treated like a god. From time to time, fetish priests would wrap it around like a human being, feed it with food, as if to keep it so alive. Not unlike friars, apples to feed the gods in badness, the ring cycle. An important memory here is about 10 years old, I am playing with a group of my classmates. And four of them decide to go and chant around a tree, chanting like fetish priests would. The headmaster sees these four boys dancing and going into a frenzy and badges out, shouting, stop boys, don't you know that's exactly how you create a God? Once upon a time, words and magic were one and the same. And that even today, words remain a decisively powerful and retain their decisively magical power. Sigmund Freud. The third strand that brings me to psychoanalysis is my interest in, in the technique of thought. My father had three wives at the same time. Children having multiple parents was quite common when I was growing up. Today, bigamy and polygamy are illegal. In my childhood, when a father had multiple wives, their children, however, were careful not to participate in parental disputes. The developmental task of having feuded parents whose children found ways to create meaningful and respectful relationships between them became a useful skill later in life. We heeded the implicit admonition to let parents carry on with their own fights. The implicit precept that children from multiple spouses obeyed was consequential. For us as children then, when we play together or when we eat together, we do not have to eat each other. Today, this developmental freedom to not have to fight battles for parents allows me to study broadly and deeply, to think independently, and to respect the technique of thought within different traditions of psychoanalysis. Today, I can both stay in my own lane, as it were, and do my best work, or make complementarities out of antinomies. And lastly, psychoanalysis and the human sciences, specifically poetry, the fourth strand that brings me to psychoanalysis is the poetry of W.H. Auden, who wrote the poem On This Island. And there is the phrase, ships diverge on urgent voluntary errands. Ships diverge on urgent voluntary errands. As a 15 year old, I had a huge argument with my Latin teacher who had had turned into an English teacher as well. He called it an oxymoron. I said, no, 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 no. There has to be something very powerful about how such a juxtaposition to take place. Today I'm writing about this. <laughs> Next came the poetry of T.S. Eliot, in the wasteland. And those of you who know it, will recognize the epigraph. It's in Latin and Greek. It reads as follows in English. Well, with my own eyes, I saw Sibyl sitting in a vessel at Kumai. And when the boy said, Sibyl, what do you want? She answered, I want to die. The question is posed in Latin. The answer is embedded in Greek. 
as a 17 year old, I was intrigued by how you can have two kinds of unconscious in the same sentence, the present unconscious and the past unconscious. As I came to his four quartets and discovered spiral circularity, which is my understanding of Nachtraglich Kite in Freud. His powerful piece, what we call the beginning, is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Accordingly, we shall not cease from, exp ex from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to end where we started and know the place for the first time. It sounds like Jacques Lacan's Apricou, where scene two, where the history catches up with the transference in scene two. These four strands give us a glimpse of how I, as a West African analyst, juxtapose Freud's better psychology as an instinct theory and Freud's symbolic anthropology as in totem and taboo. For me then, it isn't just I who migrated to study psychoanalysis. The field of psychoanalysis itself migrates so beautifully that the two go hand in hand. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pri. thank you. Uh, Dr. Marina Bayeva. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this panel. It's a fascinating question about how my and all of our immigrant experiences affected or shaped my identity as a psychoanalytic candidate and, and a therapist. And as I've been reflecting on it over the past few months, one thing I realized, well, I actually realized two things. One was is that the impact has been enormous and affected me in ways that I didn't even think about before. But the second thing I realized it's gonna be impossible to squeeze all of that into 10 minutes. So what I'm gonna to try to do is just give you a brief understanding of some of the more formative experiences and then connect some of the dots. And then hopefully during the actual discussion, we can, we can expand and explore these themes a little bit more. So I first came to the United States when I was 16 uh, and I was an exchange student at that time. But looking back at my life, I realized there was another experience that was eerily similar to immigration, even though I didn't actually move anywhere. That happened in the summer of 1991. I was seven years old at that time. And literally one night I went to sleep in one country, the Soviet Union. And then the next morning, I woke up in a different country, independent, free Ukraine. And even though I was at the same place geographically, the countries were very different from each other. The next 10 years that followed have been affectionately dubbed the wild 90s, but I would actually put it more like reckless 90s. This was the time when the old Soviet laws ceased to exist and the new Ukrainian laws have not yet been written, which allowed for enormous wealth to be both created and lost instantaneously, often through use of ruthless intimidation or even hiring contract killers. That was the landscape. And for me as a seven-year-old, it was the time of great confusion, which is really well captured by this memory. So as long as I could remember myself, I was really good at spotting money on the ground and my parents loved it. Usually it was a couple of coins and I would get a lot of praise for finding it. And then one time I found a one ruble bill and then I didn't give it to my parents. Instead, I took it to the school cafeteria and I was amazed by how many pastries I could buy with just one Soviet ruble. So when Soviet Union collapsed, Soviet ruble also ceased to exist, and then each independent country adopted its own currency. 
And that was the time when old money literally littered the streets. Large bills and small bills were laying on the ground and then the, the wind would pick them up and they would fly around like in a Hollywood movie. And I was ecstatic. I was greedily collecting as many as I could and I was bringing them to my parents and they were not at all excited like they used to be. And I'm sure they tried to explain to the seven-year-old me why these bills were no longer valuable. They were just like any other piece of paper, but it was a very difficult concept for me to grasp that just did not add up. How can something that was so valuable, all those pastries, all that happiness, could just lose its value overnight? And this was just one personal example of the confusion that permeated the entire society for more than a decade. So as I said, I first came to the United States when I was 16. And I've, ever since, I've been asked by many people whether it was a frightening experience to move across the globe at such a young age. And the answer has always been a definitive no. Because most of my life up to that point have been defined by constant change and uncertainty. And not just for my family, but for the entire country. So change was my default. Entering a new culture wasn't that different from trying to adapt to post-Soviet Ukraine while the whole country was trying to figure out its own identity and its own values all in real time. It was really like learning that those hundreds of rubles that I collected no longer held any value, but there was something else that did hold a great value, and I had to discover what it was. So adjusting to life in the U.S., I was less affected by these large cultural or political differences. I actually found it rather easy to adapt to those because that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years of my life. You just carefully observe people, you notice what they do or say, you try to follow their lead. Then you get a sense of what issues are important and then you educate yourself on those. Or like in case of me and baseball, you make a conscious decision not to because that's just not my thing. But rather what I was taken aback were these small things that seem rather inconsequential and so basic that I would never even think about questioning those or observing. So for example, as a college student, when I first arrived, when I re returned to the US after my exchange year, uh, I came down with a cold in the middle of the winter and my friends insisted that I go with them and I get some ice cream. Apparently, I learned from them that it was good to have some ice cream for sore throat. While in Ukraine, eating ice cream while sick in the middle of the winter is pretty much equivalent to a death sentence. You know that your cold will get worse, you'll get pneumonia, and that would be pretty much the end of you. So facing these rather insignificant differences probably had the most powerful impact on, on my identity as a therapist. These small blind spots were the clearest demonstration of the existence of unconscious, because most of what we know about the world gets internalized early on and completely outside of our awareness. So whether it's a deeply held belief about murderous power of ice cream or about murderous power of one's own anger, we tend to accept them as absolute truths. We don't question these convictions because this is just how the world works. Like what else is there to see? And I found that the only way to challenge this, these beliefs is to make them visible, to make them conscious by noticing where and how they clash against the existing reality, by recognizing that my way of being is one of many, many ways to live in the world. It's not always the optimal one too. And while on the larger scale, this is what I've been doing most of my life, adapting to these huge shifts that happen overnight. It was those minute blind spots that I discovered through immigration that really drove that point home for me. So now how does this all relate to my work as a therapist? So again, as I said, I'm just gonna touch on a few different examples and then maybe we can expand that. So first, the experience of living in a constantly changing world first inside independent Ukraine, and then by coming to the US, made, me, made it very easy for me to maintain a sense of not knowing and not assuming some, that I know something about a person in front of me. It is not to say that I'm not subject to unconscious biases like all of us. Of course I am. 
but seeing the world through several often conflicting lenses is really a good reminder that nothing is what it seems at first. It also helps me, helps me to respect those rigidly held beliefs, which irrational as they sound, often stem from generational traumas and their roots are deeply unconscious. Yes, I can eat all the ice cream I want to mend a sore throat without risk of dying, but I wouldn't even try explaining it to a Ukrainian grandmother who lost her father in the World War II and whose ancestors lived through many man-made famines, wars, and constant attempts to eradicate her nation. And history is unfortunately repeating itself. Second, I became kind of like a radar for spotting and then exploring and if appropriate, challenging these unconsciously held beliefs about how the world works and how the people work. I came to see the world as a complex construction of a human mind, a web of historical, societal, familial and personal beliefs. And my job is to help patients understand what their constructed world looks like. What are the rules that govern it? And where did these rules come from? And only then a patient is free to make choices about how they want to live their lives. It was through my experiences of immigration where I had to question the world around me and grapple with inconsistencies all the time, eventually led me to develop an identity uh, that is neither Ukrainian nor American, but it does definitely have elements of both. And there is also something distinct from either of the cultures. So having been there, having done that, makes a huge difference when I try to help someone else to navigate this process. And finally, there is something to be said about the phenomenon of change. While I recognize that stability is very important for healthy development, yet the world is changing all the time. And many of my patients struggle adapting to changes. So in my work, I'm very keenly aware of balancing the stability of the therapeutic frame with unpredictability of the world, not running away from it, but daring to stay it in the eye and maybe, just maybe, enjoy a little bit of uncertainty here and there. So of course there is more to say, but I will stop there. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Bayeva. Thank you. Uh, now we turn to Dr. Belsiu. I am so happy to be part of this panel. Um, I, one of the, the sort of the leading themes in my life was an experience of unbelonging in my place of origin. My parents were Greek immigrants to Germany, um, recent Greek immigrants. And I was born and, well, I was raised by um, a single mom who I started correcting, I started correcting her German as soon as I could speak. Um, my mother was a student um, and she was learning German as she was raising me. She, um, we lived in a big pre-war building that had been, um, had been divided up uh, into little student rooms. And my mother was the super and I helped her clean you know, the six story uh, building every every weekend um, and, uh, and you know, um, field the requests of the tenants. Um, there was something about the community I grew up in that wasn't exactly a holding environment that facilitated identity. Um, I think some of the Greek friends I had in my hometown, which had a large Greek population, had much bigger Greek families. Um, than I did. So there was um, this experience of unbelonging and stigma that my mother experienced pre-immigration. She um, was part of a, the, her family was part of the population exchange from Turkey to Greece. Um, and then she came um, to, she, she would joke to escape the Greek patriarchy. Um, that gave me a sense of the power of transference of place. And that became sort of a leading force of my sort of interest and me search, research and me search. Um, as a kid, um, I did not want to learn Greek. I wanted to assimilate. My mother wanted me to assimilate too. She spoke broken German to me at the time. Um, I remember many instances of sending up the Germans as a way to feel um, 
good about ourselves. I remember there was a manager of the building who would come by and speak to us. Um, he would show up um, rooms to other students and he would say, you know, um, the hallway could be cleaner, but you're Greek. So maybe you don't do it uh, as you, 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 your standards of cleanliness are not as thorough. And my mother would joke to me that he was an old Nazi with a toupee. And I remember just quietly feeling, um, you know, so just quietly mocking him. Um, there were these quiet ways of, quiet and not so quiet ways of resisting that um, helped me sort of push through. Um, I, I was a philobat in balanced terms in the sense that I believed uh, in the possibilities of an unknown place and uh, um, move there to, away from sort of the limitations of familiar objects and places. So I had a transference to place and I believed there was a place that was better than the place I was from. You know, a place that was still sort of reeling from the unspoken, unspoken terror of uh, the Second World War and the Holocaust, um, which was very much sort of in the background, but unspoken. So it was interesting listening to the um, other panelists. Uh, for a while, we lived next to a Jewish cemetery, uh, but the cemetery was not accessible. You could not enter the cemetery. So I had no idea how recent the deaths of the people were who were buried in that cemetery. I had never met a Jew. I did not know Jewish life as it was in uh, the town I came from. That all started later. Now you see little plaques explaining who lived in which house and what happened to them. It's minimal, but there, there's more there than there was when I was growing up. We would visit uh, concentration camps and we would read um, stories about the Second World War. Um, there was a lot of repetition of history about the Second World War, but we did not really learn about Jewish life and how it was interwoven into German life, um, how it was uh, separate and, and uh, deeply connected. Um, I think uh, vigilance and reading the other became important to me as a child. I remember wanting to have a little ring that would tell me what people were thinking sort of similar to what Dr. Bayeva was saying. Um, it's, that is an experience, the sort of vigilance and figuring out how to connect what the assumptions are of the people we're encountering that is sort of natural to an experience of otherness. Um, this transference to place, being able to imagine a future uh, of a place of belonging and recognition prompted me to seek out uh, a scholarship to be a high school student abroad and later on, and I was in the US and Portland, Oregon, which was a pretty inclusive and progressive place. Um, and I really had a first experience of feeling fully welcomed in and uh, my difference being found ex exciting and interesting rather than stigmatizing. Uh, at that time, of course, I also was a white European girl. Um, uh, a white European, reasonably educated girl that helped. Um, and um, I, uh, I, I quickly didn't feel the need to assimilate, but more that I would find my niche of belonging, the, the kinds of people I could relate to, um, that there could be an active involvement in shaping communities ourselves then rather than just fully fitting in. I think that relates also to this question of how do immigrants shape psychoanalysis? It's, it's sort of an active effort of um, really uh, understanding and being curious about the heterogeneity of, of stories about the motley crew of psychoanalysts we have here in the world and in America. Um, how did I get to psychoanalysis? Um, my mother had a huge role in this whole legacy. So, you know, um, her, she studied psychology and never finished her thesis uh, and then became sort of a body psychotherapist, got a license in, uh, in alternative medicine. So in a way I had an errand to run and um, I finished something that she couldn't quite finish. Um, psychoanalysis, I remember felt more rigorous developed with its developmental theory and its 
sort of emphasis of history, um, of, of, of personal history at least. Um, and I think that made sense to me as someone who sort of was, uh, as an immigrant, you're steeped in the social, you know, and um, pre-immigration to the US, I was already feeling like an immigrant kid. I didn't have German citizenship until I came to the US. So I got it at uh, early 20s. Um, so there was something about immigration as an, uh, uh, sorry, a psychoanalysis as um, offering an anchoring inside. Um, uh, and um, I'm looking here, um, not assuming on a for uniformity, uh, analyzing and questioning power structures that we would assimilate to seems a much bigger thing now than it was in psychoanalysis in the 50s. I think there's more work to be done. Um, I, I, my mother tried to rid herself of her accent, but um, my accented English is not something that I want to get rid of. Um, and I think that also was just less of a big deal in, in the United States, but it also was a personal decision of bridging the past and the present and bridging cultures and identities. So sort of this sense of self-continuity and the bridging of it is something I pay attention to in my patients between past and present and in my own life. Um, I keep remembering that this is a culture of dislocation um, that, that we're part of and that the assumption of uniformity is one that is unhelpful um, and to really sort of maintain a radical openness to that. Okay, so these are my preliminary thoughts for our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Bilzu. Okay, last but not least, as they say, you want to take it away? Thank you, Spiro. Um, I, uh, I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues. I'm just deeply moved by all of your presentations and look forward to the discussion. I'm also very moved by the previous roundtables honoring Anton Chris and, um, and I, I'm really particularly struck by the act of remembering the acts of remembrance in these roundtable series for me actually have been long awaited and it's helping, it's been helping to fill a void in my engagement with psychoanalysis. Um, and today I, I will, I'm gonna talk about very briefly about my connection to Freud's ideas. And then I'm going to join in this remembrance, uh, but within the context of my own immigration to the US from India and in doing so, I'm going to talk about another collective trauma that remains deeply repressed in the minds of American psychoanalysis, um, which is British colonization. Um, so briefly around Freud, for me, there's a ubiquitous quality to Freud's ideas, such as those of us who identify um, with cultural contexts that are far different in some important ways from those of Freud and European and North American contexts, we are still compelled by his ideas of human nature. Uh, Freud's ideas extended to a wide audience of intellectuals, even as far as Kolkata in India, the home of the first Indian psychoanalyst, Girindra Shekhar Bose. Uh, by 1914, Bose had developed his psychoanalytic ideas almost independently of Freud and published a book entitled The Concept of Repression in 1921. And there was actually a correspondence between Bose and Freud that started in 1921 and lasted 16 years. Their letters indicate Freud's ambivalence about addressing the cultural specifics of Bose's ideas particularly in light of Freud's identifications with European intellectual traditions and Bose's identifications with Indian cultural ideology and Hindu spirituality. Um, while post-independence India experienced a decline in psychoanalysis, largely because of poverty, war, and partition, Freud's and Bose's ideas have resurfaced in the past 40 years or so within a diaspora of psychoanalytic scholars of Indian origin. 
And in my own professional work, I have wondered at times what it might mean for me, an Indian American uh, woman psychologist, to be so interested in the theories of the mind developed by a male Viennese um, psychiatrist in the early 20th, a neurologist in the early 20th century. And what I found is that clinically his ideas allowed me to have a better understanding of the longstanding complicated nature of immigration. Freud challenged us to consider a world that's not free from human suffering. He didn't see the individual's past or a society's past as something that can be eradicated or outgrown, but as an integral part of one's existence. And these were revolutionary ideas. Um, so moving to my own immigration, my immigration from India is often perceived by others in the US as a choice, uh, as primarily involving a choice. I was seven years old when I moved from uh, Hyderabad, India, which is in South India, um, to the Bronx in New York City in 1977. Children certainly don't have a choice in migration. And for my family, the legacy of British colonization and caste and regional based violence became the impetus for our departure from India. My maternal grandfather and my father, both physicians in India, um, we originally come from farming families um, and we're a rural part of Andhra Pradesh in India. But my maternal grandfather and my father had become physicians. They were the first in their families to attend high school, college, and so on. They were afforded opportunities to retrain as physicians in the US. And while they could have chosen to stay in India, broader collective violence, specifically that targeting our family and other people known as Andras in, um, in this uh, region of Hyderabad, led to the eventual decision to leave. The Andras, my community, many of whom had migrated from rural areas of the state called Andhra Pradesh, were perceived to be a threat to another group, the Telanganas, who had been native for centuries in the former, in the former Mughal province of Hyderabad. In the late 1960s, after being targeted by violence, our family dispersed to different parts of India. So our family home was placed on fire by, by the members of another group, the Telanganas. And this was known as the Telangana agitation at that time. Um, so at that time, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, um, whom we sort of lived in an extended family with, um, had decided to disperse the family. So I had aunts and uncles who were placed in different regions of India. My mother was pregnant with me, was expecting me, and my brother was two and a half years older than me. And so they were sent, we were sent um, to um, my father's village uh, in the rural part of Andhra Pradesh. And some years later, um, well, we were we returned to the city um, at the time of my birth. And a few years later, my maternal grandparents moved to New York. My parents, my older brother, and I would then follow years later. Um, interestingly, what I've been hearing in uh, other roundtables and in our presentations today, the traumatic events that led to our migration to the U.S. was discussed only on a surface level. My brother and I were aware that there was this Telangana agitation that led to this disruption in our family, but we rarely talked about the agitation with other people. Importantly, a different narrative about our migration came to dominate our family discussions, and that is that we were here in the U.S. to seek better educational and career opportunities to avoid the growing corruption in India that made it difficult to continue living there. This narrative interestingly matched well with the prevalent notion of the model minority Asian who seeks to become successful academically and financially, one that does not speak about trauma and disrupt. Yet it's clear that British colonization in India shaped our migration from India and our lives in the United States. Before colonization, India was among the largest manufacturers in the world with high quality textiles as one example. Um, the historian Madhushri Mukherjee has described how the British regime imposed 
exorbitant taxes preventing Indians from selling cloth within our own country and exporting it, leading to a deindustrialization of India. In fact, there was this interesting quote um, uh, that I just want to uh, name as an again in the in the spirit of remembering. In 1840, the chairman of East India and China Association bragged to the Brit British Parliament the following. This company, the East India Company, has succeeded in converting India from a manufacturing country into a country exporting raw pr produce. India gradually was drained of its wealth and the revenues made from taxing Indian people were pocketed by British and British settler colonies, including the United States, Canada, and Australia. Indians were left vulnerable to hunger and disease, and it's now estimated that 100 million people died during the height of British colonialism due to colonial policies. This is among the largest policy-induced mortality crisis, crises in human history. Returning to our experience of living in the U.S., my family faced other forms of discrimination rooted in colonized views of Indians and South Asians, for example, we lived in New Jersey. We had moved there from New York to New Jersey in the 1980s, which was the era of the dot busters, the dot referring to the bindi worn by many Hindus. And um, the dot busters were a white street gang that terrorized people of South Asian descent for about 15 years in New Jersey and parts of Northern Pennsylvania. Our home was vandalized and we were called racial slurs. My brother and I walked home from school in fear of young white teenage boys chasing us. This history remains largely unknown to the broader U.S. population and to South Asians who migrated to the U.S. more recently or maybe lived in another part of the U.S. We were taught in our homes to focus on our schoolwork, assimilate to white culture as a way to prevent exposure to further racism. Staying under the radar, in fact, is not a cultural trait. It was a survival mechanism in colonial and post-colonial India, now transferred to being an Indian in the US. It was dangerous to be fully one's Indian self. However, as we survived in this way, the repression of traumas, both related and unrelated to colonization within our family and our Indian community continued to be reinforced and rewarded in mainstream context. Staying under the radar met the demands of dominant society and institutions. So I'll just say a couple of things about um, psychoanalytic psychotherapy and training in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. In reflecting once again on Freud and connecting his theories to the experience of migration, one of the things that stands out for me is Freud's development of psychoanalysis and the development of American psychoanalysis were never divorced from cultural experience, political realities, and the Nazi Holocaust. The repression and disavowal of the trauma of the Holocaust have reverberated through organized psychoanalysis and contributed to both the rise and marginalization of psychoanalysis. The dissociation of psychoanalysts' own colonized theories manifests in different ways, including its contributions to the notions of the primitive and savage used to justify slavery and colonization. And this dissociation of violence in psychoanalytic history is evident in silence. When I started graduate school, there was no mention of social context as it related to any theory of psychotherapy. Um, and as we moved into the 1990s, uh, the multicultural psychology movement brought to the foreground experiences of people of color, but proposed models that felt reject, quite reductionistic to me. And psychoanalytic writing continued to separate the psychic and the social during this time, raising the question as to whether the unconscious was only worth exploring among white people. Please bear in mind the implications of colonization, slavery, and genocide here as well, for me, psychoanalysis carries the potential to decolonize theories about development, health, and pathology, even while it has contributed to this problem of colonization. For example, I've argued that we need to consider how context um, shapes theoretical constructs like separation, individuation, our views on how secure attachment develops and where our understanding of dependency comes from. 
This inquiry to me doesn't mean that we idealize or devalue certain cultures or beliefs or norms or theories for that matter. Rather, can we welcome history, culture, and context instead of dismissing, disavowing, and disassociating from them? My patients remind me all the time of the importance of this as they struggle with being recognized, their experiences being recognized in a society that continues to deny or remain apathetic to the significance of their racialized and their cultural experiences. So I'm gonna leave you with um, just one um, last memory, one memory of when I was eight years old, um, and this was after we moved to New York uh, from Hyderabad. I had become more proficient in English at that time. I had started to learn English primarily after uh, coming to the US. I had written an essay for a Telugu magazine. The Telugu is my, um, my first language. And it was a new organization that was developing in New York at that time. Um, so I, I wrote a small essay for this magazine and it was about how I wish the US and India were geographically right next to each other. Maybe there could be a bridge I could walk across just going back and forth. And this would allow me to do to see my family whenever I wished. I wouldn't have to leave either set of my grandparents nor the, the vast array of people and things I loved in both countries. There was no such bridge that would allow me to walk across my two countries. In my view, there's no psychic integration that's fully possible in immigration. Instead, there are new and old experiences that shift between foreground and background. And as noted by scholars like Alan Rowland and Ghislaine Boulanger, there is this dual sense of self. Um, there is a doubleness that we occupy, that we, in, that we inhabit. And psychoanalysis help, has helped me to better engage with this complexity of being an immigrant. Still, we have a long way to go in addressing the neglect of sociocultural experience and colonization in theory, training, and practice. Our institutions carry an important responsibility to remember and repair collective suffering. And um, recently museums around the world are starting to return certain objects that were stolen from former colonies. The British Museum has yet to return the wealth stolen from India. When something is stolen and never returned, the trauma persists across generations. It's minimized. And so my hope is that American psychoanalysis and psychoanalysis more broadly will do better. So I will stop with that. Thank you, Dr. Tamala Nara. Thank you. And um, your uh, last point reminded me of um, uh, the Greeks losing their marbles. Uh, and, um, but maybe we'll get to that. Okay, this has been uh, quite a uh, set of remarks, right? Both personal and also psychoanalytic in so many ways. So I'm just wondering if some of the panelists have some comments, if uh, we're running a little late, so if you could keep them brief on each other's um, uh, mini presentations, uh, if you will some thoughts about, some associations to what others, uh, what some of your fellow panelists have said. Just want to quickly comment on how this question of immigration by choice is really a complex one and came up for all the panelists. And, you know, that made me reflect on my own experience where on the surface, I immigrated in search of opportunities. Going deeper, my mom, sought opportunities in a large city, escaping from a small village where there were no opportunities, rampant alcoholism, discrimination, all kinds of things. And in a way, I followed in her footsteps. So even though it was a choice of my generation, I was also living something up that was of my mom's generation. And perhaps you mentioned all those border changes that were mm -hmm. going on. Uh, and those border changes, certainly in that part of the world, and probably in all other parts of the world, have been ongoing for centuries. And we kind of, even when we think we belong somewhere, it may change. Uh, and uh, although perhaps things have gotten more accelerated a little bit in the last couple of, well, at least in the last half a century, I'm not sure, but that 
maybe the historians and sociologists could tell us more about that. You know, how about some others, reactions to each other's presentations? Yulia, Maurice, Usha. Maurice, I think you're muted. You have to unmute. We want to hear your voice. There we go. Mm -hmm. Julia, thank you for, for the vignette on the identification with your mother, the, the piece where uh, you continue where she left off, so to speak. Mm. You described it as your errand. Uh -huh. We are our mother and not our mother. And so it's cute to, to it was very nice to, to, to see you having worked through that. Do you want to say anything about that? see how I, am I audible You're right on, now? you're on, Julia. Oh, good, good. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I do think there's a profound way in which my identification with my mother was to um, sort of uh, work on a greater degree of freedom mm -hmm. um, and a greater degree of feeling uh, empowered in the mm -hmm. world and also to break free from limitations. Mm -hmm. I do believe, you know, just as all of us experience in midlife, I think all of this is also sort of lifespan theory. Mm -hmm. um, when we have a transference to place, we will come up against the limitations inside of ourselves at some point. So the little Auslander kind the, mm -hmm. the kid who did not belong, mm -hmm. um, is still with me just as much as the part of me that uh, freed herself from it. Right. So um, there's an interesting dialogue that happens uh, between the younger versions of ourselves um, and the kinds of things we try to, um, we, we actively grapple with, and that's the only you know, we, we cannot submit to trauma by not looking it straight in the eye. I think psychoanalysis helps with that, sort of the truth seeking of the pain. But I think there's still parts of ourselves that we have to live with that interact with the other parts of ourselves that are much more empowered and much freer. And so I find that interesting in my work with, uh, with patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yulia, you mentioned uh, World War II and mm -hmm. the effects of that, at least in your growing up in the um, in uh, Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, the way issues of uh, anti-Semitism were addressed or not addressed in the cemeteries. But I also I also heard you say that your mother uh, was part of the population exchange between the Turks and the Greeks in the twenties, in the early twenties. And that, uh, could you say, and, and, and you clearly said, uh, you used the term intergenerational transmission. Uh, what role did that play? Because that wasn't even an earth, that sounds to me like, you know, that was a population exchange of, uh, of one, point, one and a half million people, right? Yes. So what was the effect on that and your mother? And then how did that, if it did, how did it show up later for you? That earlier, massive trauma uh, of, of uh, not belonging uh, for your mom. How did that play? How do you think it worked for you if it did? Well, I'm still uncovering it clearly because I just talked to my mother about this experience, trying to clarify a little bit where she came from, where she landed. Uh, so, so it was her parents who came. Uh, were actually born in Greece. The grand, my mother, my great grandparents were part of the population exchange. My grandmother, who I'm named after, Yulia, and um, and Nikos, my grandfather, were born in a village in Macedonia that was basically populated by displaced people who uh, came from the population exchange. So uh, formerly, that had been the the Turkish population of Greece had built tobacco there, uh, grown tobacco there. And then when the Greeks who had previously lived in Turkey uh, had uh, to come to Greece, um, they were settled there. They were settled there and in other places. So she told me that 
um, everyone from her town spoke different dialects, had all been through the same trauma. Um, and uh, that- So they spoke Greek with an accent. They spoke Greek with an accent. And the, and, and the, and the host Greeks probably saw them as foreigners and as not belonging. Is that fair yes. to say? Yes. Well, that goes way back. We're talking about 100 years ago. Yes. Right? Okay. So the belonging issue, would you say, and forgive me for, I, I also speak a little bit more freely because I know you from NYU postdoc. Yes, so of course. Would you say that the issue of belonging has been transmitted all the way to you, all those generations? You know, I thought that being an immigrant kid in Germany prompted me to not fully feel at home in Germany. Yes. But what I'm coming to learn more and more is that my mother did not just feel like a black sheep in her family, which she has talked about before, but that there also was a social, a, a, a traumatic social dimension to her experience that I didn't even know about, that I just recently interviewed her about. That okay. otherness was very real for her. The stigma she felt in Germany was a stigma she previously knew uh, in Greece as well. Yes. Um, so she just exchanged one sense of stigma for another. Or added one on top of another. That's right. Yeah, yeah in a way, it's, it takes us back to that old Freudian term of uh, it, it being overdetermined. Mm -hmm. right? A familiar yeah. pain. <laughs> a familiar pain, yeah, over the centuries, over the centuries, yeah. yeah. How about some other questions for each other? Ideas, associations that you had? I'm really struck by um, everyone's uh, stories in, in terms of the insider and outsider experience, whether we're talking about these shifting borders, um, but this this experience of not belonging and shifts in where you belong, you know, uh, that our lifespan, uh, you know, lifelong kinds of struggles. And I, I wondered about also, are the way that there in some of our stories we talked about development also and how um, conceptualizations of development like Maurice your what you shared about your father having three wives and how that's how that's construed in another context you know that um, that feels that monogamy right is and a monogamous marriage is a um, is a superior way of doing things. And so it makes me think a great deal about the construction of our theories of health and pathology and development more generally, and how as immigrants, we, um, what we do with that within psychoanalysis. Right. When I went to uh, England, uh, it was the days when the controversial discussions were taking place. What is the aftermath of it? And I always kept wondering, why can't two ideas coexist? What is this about? <laughs> it seems so strange to me that people could not understand the politics of interpretation and how different traditions can have depth of their own, nuances of their own, why did they have to cancel each other? And I am very thankful that my siblings across different spouses always found ways to respect each other, to love each other, and to work with each other. Well, would you say that there was a, a kind of a, um, uh, a, a bit more of a collectivistic attitude? We gave the parents the freedom to hate each other while we found other ways to collaborate. Uh -huh. So the siblings kind of banded together. Worked together. They worked together. Played together, played together, didn't feel they had to carry the burdens of their parents. Uh -huh. Interesting. When I first, when I, the first week of uh, going from Hampstead to um, my analyst in Chelsea, I would miss my way, I end up in Belsize Lane at the Tavistock Clinic. And it happened four days in a row. And then the fifth day, my analyst said to me, 
I think you have to make up your mind whether you want to study at the Hampstead Clinic or the Tavistock Clinic. <laughs> if you stay with Anna Freud, you will learn a great deal about conscious and unconscious behavior. And you can do many things with it. You can elaborate your studies online later. Thankfully, I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. I am curious about um, psychoanalytic education and uh, the experience of trying to address decolonizing and the social and make it a, a space that is um, more inclusive and also more consciously addresses uh, sort of the the wrongdoings of the past. What has been right now seems to be a very polarized time at psychoanalytic institutes. I'm um, I'm raising this uh, both with Usha and uh, with you, Spiro. Um, and uh, what's been your experience? What are the challenges? Do you can you share your thinking? Well, I can. I think Maurice's point about coexistence. Is, a, is critical here because it seems, you know, the idea of just canceling out what we feel uncomfortable with or what feels triggering to us, um, whether it's personally or, you know, our attachment to theories, whatever it might be, or our attachment to people with certain theories. Um, I, th I think there's a, there's a way in which we can't assume that there's a superiority to one formulation versus the other. You know, if you consider the pluralism of human beings and human experience, how in the world can a singular theory capture it all, you know, or a singular perspective capture it all? But there's a way in which I think when we think about decolonizing, I always think about how can we humanize our cultural narratives rather than try to somehow reduce them to um, to fit our own perspective, to, to sort of filter through our own lens and how do we challenge that lens continually or examine it uh, in such a way that we're not so deeply or solely attached to that way of thinking, but that we have some flexibility in our thinking. So to me, I think about how the dogma, you know, whether we're talking about government dogma or policy dogma or institutional dogma, that there's that to me has always felt like the suffocating, you know, sort of um, experience. And um, one of the reasons that I didn't pursue psychoanalytic training formally is because of that, that I had felt that I had done enough in graduate school and in my career to sort of challenge some of the um, um, existing ideologies certainly around my community, my experience, um, but also of so many others. And so I, I think that it's been a difficult thing. It's been an ambivalent relationship that I've had. And um, whereas I love psychoanalysis, I also have this ambivalence around institutionalized psychoanalysis. Well, to build a little bit on, on um on what you just said, uh, Osha, even though I'm the director of a psychoanalytic institute uh, and maybe one of the largest in the world, I have tremendous ambivalence about it. Uh, and my ambivalence, you know, first of all, the, you know, I start out, I'm an er erratic Marxist. And one of the things that Marx said uh, was that all revolutions are taken over by clerks. Okay? And clerks, need to put things in file cabinets, right? Uh, clerks need uh, to have pigeonholes right? and because they need to be organized. So they have to have pigeonholes, but also, you know, pigeonholes are for pigeons. Uh, we as psychoanalysts or people who are interested in human tragedy, that's what I think we really, I think it was said in one of the previous panels that that's what we're working at. We're working at, we're working on the edge of human tragedy when we're working with individuals or communities or, or groups. Um, and 
I think that there's a way that organizational dynamics play out differently than individual dynamics. And I think psychoanalysts, as a general rule, not all of them. I know, Maurice, you worked at the at the um, uh, the uh, Voltan Center for the human, the study of the human mind, and and, and studied all those international uh, situations. Actually, worked on them, not just studied on them. But I think that that um, especially in the United States, where the premium is on the individual, on the individual, and to be individualistic. Uh, and in that sense, also, that's what makes us extraordinary as a nation. We are a nation of individualists. Then you have this other idea that uh, we have a melting pot, you know? So the whole thing is like wacko on some level, on, on some kind of philosophical level. It's bizarre. Um, and I think that there's something about organized psychoanalysis uh, that um, would not would probably not have as a member Freud or some of his uh, uh, earlier uh, some of his earlier groups who were really quite revolutionary. But the revolutions are always taken over by clerks. Okay, and then the then the challenge is if you're in the leadership not to let the clerks uh, be at the forefront of the revolution. You have to be able to court creativity and to court. Uh, um, independent thinking, but independent thinking that doesn't silence, that doesn't remain, you know, the previous panels that I think were fantastic talked about the silence that was going on in organized psychoanalysis. They also talked about authoritarianism, right, which is a big, big issue that we're still trying to grapple with. In fact, if you just today, if you look at the psychoanalytic news today, you can see what's going on in the American Psychoanalytic Association that's decompensating with internal battles. And that has a ripple effect on organizations too, beyond that, including my institute, it has a ripple effect on that. So I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Yulia, but it is an important question, uh, a very important question. I do think that the, the word respect is missing. You know, respect for each other is missing. I was very fortunate to have been interviewed by uh, Heinz Kohut for Anna Freud when I was interviewed for Hampstead. I spent two, three hour sessions with the, with the gentleman was very generous, intellectually, emotionally, attitudinally. Whenever he asked me a question I couldn't answer, he would say, play with it. And the joy of having to think together with another person has stayed with me for decades. I'm not a Kahutian, I'm a Freudian. I start with this displayed Freudian framework, but the attitude, that respectful attitude that I took away from Hayes Kahut has stayed with me in conversations about different disciplines, in conversations with patients, Etc. 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 That's the piece I think we are missing. Yes. Well, it was a different era, wasn't it, Maurice? Yes. It yes. was a very different era. That that uh, word is too loaded now, and sometimes it's also used as a way to control others. Right? Uh, you know, you're not being respectful. You're challenging us, or you're being antagonistic is a, a kind of a, a, an indirect way uh, that I think can also undermine us. So it depends on who uses it and with what spirit they use it. It was certainly a kind of a, uh, one of the things that the earlier panelists, uh, I heard lament. I, I, I heard lamentation that they, they were nostalgic about the time that psychoanalysis was so cultured, that had to do so much with culture. And of course, the. I think a lot of things happened, but uh, around that, and not the least being the kind of medical domination in the United States and the materialistic domination in the United States. 
I mean, in, in other parts of the world, you didn't become a psychoanalyst because you wanted to get rich, you know, uh, or you wanted to to have status and power over others. That didn't that didn't that that was not in the picture then, as far as I could tell. As far as I uh, could tell. Um, how about some other comments, uh, Marina? You're one of the youngest here. Uh, how do you hear all this? You know how I hear. What I want to add to that is the experience of dehumanizing the other which is very familiar to me so Usha, on one hand i totally get how much work it is to be the ambassador the human face not the dehumanized but the actual human face representing your culture your values your differences and on the other hand it is through these one-on-one -on -one human experiences that the change happens when you actually get to know somebody who is who has this complicated identity and they become real they become maybe even a friend and then your attitude completely shifts i remember coming from ukraine which is despite all the changes and differences is a very homogeneous culture and coming to a liberal arts college in the U.S. with all the diversity and all the opinions and actually meeting the people who represented these different groups that in Ukraine we couldn't even imagine who they were and realizing they're people. They're kind of like me, but then they're quirky in this and that way and okay. they're easy to relate. Okay. And completely changing how I see those different groups. And Okay. We're going to, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, we're going to go back to Jane, uh, Dr. Tillum, who's going to uh, perhaps uh, uh, raise some questions from the uh, audience. Great. So, uh, Daniela, I think will also be joining us. We have a few questions from the Q&A. Uh, I think people have found the presentation very rich and thought provoking. And uh, one uh, question is, what's the connection in each of your psychological experiences of the other, uh, in parentheses, uh, capital O, other, and the profound insight of pseudospecies uh, developed by Eric Erickson, uh, also an immigrant from Europe to the United States. Uh, Erickson writes about pseudospeciation. I think we would call that dehumanization. Mm -hmm. Now, the way we dehumanize uh, other people. Um, Maurice, you talked about animation, and I think, Lucia, uh, the terrifying story of your uh, childhood adolescence of the, the white gang uh, has a kind of dehumanization uh, in that. And I think, Marina, the, the war in your country right now also involves elements of dehumanization. So what, what can you say about um, the experiences of occupying uh, at various times as dehumanized? place of not that all others are dehumanized but potentially that's a step in that direction may i add to that jane of course how did it feel how did it feel Or how does it feel? How does it feel to do what? James? Uh, to be in the spot of the uh, so-called other uh, mm -hmm. as an immigrant and to experience uh, mm -hmm. episodes of dehumanization based on that status. Okay. I am a little different from that. Um, I always feel I belong wherever I go. I don't have this sense of alienation that people who are thrown by trauma and forced immigration have felt. I was very fortunate to have been raised by a grandfather, predominantly, who was the treasurer of the United Gold Coast Convention. And their task was to overthrow the British government. But even so, he had a strategy. He wanted the energy of the youth and the wisdom of the old to work together to overthrow the British government until the nationalists decided to take over and decide they didn't need my grandfather's uh, services anymore. 
It was a memorable Saturday morning when the leader of the Young Nationalists came to visit. Grandfather excused himself, went to see the young man, and then it was a very short meeting. He came back to the group of children and grandchildren and said, nobody from this house should ever go into politics. I was six years old. To this day, nobody from my house has ever gone into politics. The point of this was that I found out a few years ago that the young man who came to visit him was Kwame Nkrumah, who became the head, the first prime minister of Ghana. The breakup was memorable because it had two meanings for me. In the short run, grandfather was wrong. The man became the first prime minister of Ghana who used hate, propaganda, and everything else he could to win the premiership. But within three years, he had become the life president of Ghana. The rest is history. The point here is that the psychoanalytic mind that I take from that story is that change can be ethical, quiet, and so still subversive. This is how I have changed the life of minority groups at the University of Virginia in the last 40 years. Quiet, ethical, strategic votes. But he became say life that. president. But he became life president? Yes, within three years. Okay, well, that's kind of complicated, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not very complicated if you understand narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's complicated for the people. Indeed. U Usha, what were you going to say? Um, so my, my experience, I would say, is... Um, it's a mix because on one hand, um, being dehumanized is diminishing. It's It makes you feel invisible. It makes me feel invisible. It makes me feel angry. It makes me feel empathic towards people. It gives me an insight into what it could feel like. Um, it makes me want to do something with it that's constructive. But I will say the hardest thing about um, the experience of dehumanization is watching people you love be dehumanized. Mm -hmm. So if I have, you know, watching my parents suffer from racism, from being diminished because of their accent or being diminished and being told things like the British did great things for India by people around them. I've heard that, my parents have heard that, my children have heard that. So, or to see my sons experience those things, that is the hardest part of this being the other. Um, and those things I carry with me in my work as, and I can listen differently as a function of those experiences. And at the same time, I have to deal with my own personal suffering with that. It doesn't change the fact that we also have great resilience and my parents taught me how to protect myself in certain regards, but not in other ways. And that's still something I, I continue to learn. Usha, that resonates with me because I was thinking about this question of otherness. There were two distinct phases in how it affected me. The first one was a true rebellion I'll show you who I am. I'll show you what I'm worth. If you don't want me, I'll find people who can understand me. And then it really morphed into, I have this freedom to be whoever I want to be within obviously the laws of the place where I live, but I can eat ice cream or not eat ice cream. I can make these choices that are different for different cultures or go beyond those cultures. And so that's been very liberating and it's a more recent thing, but I thought I could kind of see how that morphed into, well, I'm not defined by one or the other culture. I can be both and more. And so that was very empowering. Mm -hmm. 
I had to um, think back about the first panel in which both uh, Thomas Kohut and um, um, Kernberg. Kernberg, of course, Otto Kernberg, both talked about the paranoia in a parent that they witnessed. Um, you know, I think for Otto Kernberg, it was his mother. For Thomas Kernberg, it was at least his father, if I remember correctly. And sort of this understanding that it was very real to be in a hostile environment, in an extremely hostile environment, and what that does to your psyche. And how I, you know, can relate to gradations of that experience. And, um, and that it's really self-states we're talking about, different kinds of self-states of resisting against it, finding freedom within it, collapsing into a particular kind of fear. Um, and, and that really, it's not just psychoanalytic work, it's, it's literally a, a, an organizational work of figuring out how to find interest groups and people who are like you and who have your back. That ultimately is, is the work. We are uh, at our time boundary, so I want to thank uh, Ciro for your moderation and uh, Daniela for your partnership uh, from the Freud Museum of Vienna and to all our wonderful presenters today. Very uh, deep and uh, personal, uh, rich presentations uh, to close out our roundtable series, so thank you so much. Uh, and to all of our participants, uh, information on how to receive CE, CME is in the chat, and it can take up to 24 hours for your attendance to register. And we hope you'll join us this summer, uh, if you're this way, to see the exhibition or to contribute your immigration story to our project. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the organizers. Thank you. It was Thank an you. honor. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank Be you. well. Bye. 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 Bye.